Now that you've finalized your Jupyter Notebook setup and we reviewed some background on Jupyter, let's get started with the notebook environment. The first page we are at is called a dashboard. It basically lists the contents of the folder you launched Jupyter Notebook from. You can navigate around your file system through this dashboard, just like any other file explorer interface. A note here is that this file system is where the Jupyter Notebook server is running. It could even be on another machine. If you don't use the local host as the server in your laptop locally, you'll simply see another interface. At this point, I would like to remind you to follow along if you haven't already started doing it. We know one of the biggest obstacles to success in online classes is getting started working with the infrastructure and your learning environment. So I really want you to do this with me. We are just going to get our first notebook started run some initial code, and add some documentation. It shouldn't take you much time, but it will get you up and running. If you get set up now, for the rest of the course, you'll be able to follow along in notebooks with the material we present and play ar around with the code yourself. OK, now let's create a new notebook with the Neve button on this upper right corner. Here, we will select Python 3 as our Python version. Now I have a new notebook, and I click on Untitled on top to name it. I'll just name it to be Intro Notebook here. So we renamed our notebook. Now, if we go back to our dashboard, we will see that there's a new notebook, a file called intronotebook.ipynb. That's the new um, notebook we just created and renamed. In the beginning, there's sometimes some confusion as both the notebook application and the notebook are called notebook, but they are separate. The notebook application is a web, web application that creates the interface in the browser and executes Python and other languages code. The notebook file is a file format with the IPYNB extension that saves code, images, and text in a single document easy enough to be shared. As we said before, this feature has gained lots of popularity in data science. You probably realize this, but the intro notebook, notebook is in a different browser tab in your browser. Any new notebook that I open will be a new tab like this, and you can have many open at the same time. Now let's get started with coding using the code cells. Hopefully you're following along, but please feel free to pause the video and try each step I show you if you fall behind. It is normal to take some time in the beginning, so don't worry if it's causing some confusion at times. I will now click on the first cell. It's just simply click with the mouse in the rectangular cell in the notebook and type Python code. Like I can say print hello world, which is our traditional greeting in any computer science uh, programming course. So I can run this code in a few different ways. One is I can go to the toolbar on top and push the Run button. I should just get the result, as we see here, Hello World was printed. Or I can re-click on that cell and enter, Shift, Enter simultaneously. It should run the same cell. Note that this is executing code in a Python process called the kernel. Uh, so there is a kernel running in the background for each open notebook uh, or browser tab, basically. The Jupyter Notebook application talks to the kernel to have it load data and execute code. Shift Enter, or that play button, creates another cell just below the first one while we are executing it, or while the kernel is executing it. So this one here is the second cell we have. So we can say that a Jupyter Notebook is a collection of cells, some including code, like we just did. Now that we have learned working with cells, let's execute more code. For instance, you can use the notebook as a calculator. 
a question we can ask here is uh, how many seconds are in a year? So we need to count the number of days times 24 for hours times 60 for minutes and 60 for seconds. Remember, we run it either by the uh, run button on our toolbar here or shift enter. So I run it by saying shift enter and I got that big number in the output here. So you might have noticed when I print something, it shows up as a text right under my code cell. And if I just run a cal calculation without an assignment or a print statement like I did here, it comes up as an output line. Here we have the out three line for that number. So that number is kind of difficult to read. It's a large number. So let's convert it to millions. To do that, in the next cell, I'll type underscore divided by 1e6. And I say shift run. We see that uh, the output is turned into uh, a number in millions. So here, let's explain what I've done. Underscore refers to the output of the last cell executed. So since we executed that uh, in tree line before, um, we are using the shorthand scientific notation for 10 to the power 6 uh, to convert it to a number in millions. So then we run it, and it's like 31.536 million seconds. So this is a little better and easier to read. So now I'm thinking, what about a leap year? Right, because leap years have 366 days. The good thing about the Jupyter Notebook is that you can go back to a cell and update it and run it again. So what I'll do to look for a leap year is I'll simply uh, say, go to that in tree line. Uh, and it shows, those numbers show the order of execution. And I'll go and update that line instead of 366 to be uh, three, three, 65 to be 366. So after we modify the cell, um, we will calculate the seconds with the new question on how many seconds are there in a leap year in this case. So I go say shift enter, and we see that number has changed. But since we haven't executed the next cell, the number in that hasn't changed yet but the environment put us in the next cell so we can rerun that um, same cell again. So we have that in four line, and we know that in five was executed after that because uh, the number in there is sequentially larger. So I'm going to say sh um, shift enter in that in four line, now it's in six, and we know that that number has been updated. So good. But maybe we'd like to have both of them inside our notebook. I want to have the question for how many days are there in a leap year, and I also want to have the regular years. Then what do we do? Here, we can just copy and paste the code cell to have separate cells for the code related to both questions, uh, instead of updating the cell completely. To do this, I'll use the cut and paste buttons on the toolbar. Um, so I'm going to go to that cell, and I'll click on that in five line, the cell that associates to that. And here, I'll have cut and paste. I'll simply copy, and I'll push paste right next to the copy button. So now I have two cells. In the second cell, um, I can say 365 um, times 24 times 60 times 60, and I'll rerun that. Um, I'll have uh, the answers to both questions on how many seconds are there in a year, in a regular year and a leap year. Of course, I need to do the same then um, for the um, million conversion one. So I can go and say paste here. I need to click on the cell above where I want to paste it. So if I go now to in five and go through as Shift enter to run that, shift enter to run the next one, shift enter to run um, in seven, now it turned to be in 10, and shift enter to run the last line. We have everything nicely executed in a sequence. So until now, we used code cells with only one line. But actually, the 
code in that code cell doesn't have to be one-liners, as we have done in our quick examples. You can do any type of Python code in the notebook. Sometimes it could be as simple as importing a module. Sometimes it could be printing a variable or creating sophisticated analysis or graphs. Um, but let's go with a two-liner now. Right? If you run in there any Python code, I am now clicking in that last cell. If I simply say there, x equals 4 plus 3, OK? And in the next line, print x. Um, now, when I run it by Shift-Enter, the environment will run that block of code. So something you'll notice, um, when I click on this, if I go with um, my up and down arrows, I can move between different lines of code. And once I come to the top line, um, I can go to the cell above. But this could be a bit of a challenge when I have too many lines and you want to quickly um, switch between different code cells. Uh, maybe you want to move around a few cells up and down quickly without using your mouse, uh, just through your, your keyboard. For that purpose, uh, the notebook interface is uh, implemented to be modal. That means uh, if you do escape in the cell border, just like I'm going to do here, escape uh, in the in 12 cell that we have there, you can now use the up and down arrows on your keyboard to change cells. So uh, my cursor before I've done this was in, was in that print X line. So if I wasn't in uh, that escape mode, uh, where my cell is highlighted as blue, if I push the up arrow, I would go into that x equals 4 plus 3 line. Now I can just uh, push the up arrow and move between the cells. So it's a very useful feature. Uh, I can go and execute these, and it's still in that uh, modal uh, mode. So now, how do we get rid of some of these cells? Right? Let's um, click on our code cell in the bottom. It turned green for us to type. I'll say print, and I'll call that string temp. OK, I execute this. Now, uh, maybe I wanted to do a quick check of something, and I don't want that permanently in my notebook. I can just click on it and um, simply here say cut um, in the upper toolbar, and it's going to get uh, deleted. Let's end our code cell introduction here. Uh, so you'll see more of it as we go through the weeks. Uh, and next, we will actually look at some special cells called markdown cells in a notebook.